Okay. Let's see. All right. All right. I think people are joining. Hello, everybody. Welcome to another Third Place Books virtual event. And my name is Claire, and I'm a bookseller at Third Place Books. For those of you who maybe don't know who we are or who are watching from somewhere else in the country, we are a local independent bookstore to Seattle. We have three locations and we buy new and used books and we've been around since 1998. So we really love what we do and we love hosting virtual events and we've been so sad that we haven't been able to have authors in the store like we normally do but we're so grateful to have this virtual platform in order to connect you with your favorite authors and readers and it is still a very fun way to a new way to make those connections so that's really exciting to us um well I would also like to say, if you are interested in further supporting us and further supporting our wonderful authors that we have here, um, I would encourage you to go ahead and hop onto our website where you can purchase both of their books if you are able. Um, this is just a great way to support us and to support them and read great books. And I will go ahead and be linking those in the chat throughout the event. So don't worry, don't have to rush to the website, they'll be there. And if you are interested in buying a book, I just want to say that we do still have signed copies of Switch. So if you are interested in getting one of these, I would definitely do it sooner than later. And if you really want to make sure you get your signed copy of Switch, um, it's actually our May pick for our young adult subscription box. And that box is called Lit Reads and it ships out once every other month. So you get six boxes a year and the books are handpicked by our booksellers. They're the ones that they cannot stop raving about. So Switch is this one. And you'll get in every box, a first edition signed hardcover copy of a new release young adult book. And you will also get a letter written by one of our booksellers telling you why they love the book so much, as well as a custom bookmark that our graphic designer made. And then you always get a gift. So this box's gift is a paperback copy of Dig by A.S. King. So we're really excited about this box. And if you're interested in signing up, it's something you can sign up for any time throughout the year. And I'll go ahead and link that in the chat as well. Okay, let's see what else is on my list. Oh, yes. If you do want to make sure you don't miss events like this, go ahead and check out our website and you can sign up for our newsletter. Um, we have all kinds of cool events throughout the year, especially virtually now, only virtually now. And um, we have one coming up uh, for Rachel Griffin for her buzzworthy debut, The Nature of Witches. She'll be in conversation with Adrian Young and that's actually her launch event on June 1st. So yeah, definitely go ahead and sign up for our newsletter so you don't miss that. And we also are on social media. We're at Third Place Books on all the platforms. And if you want kids and young adult content exclusively, we are at Third Place Books Kids on Instagram. Okay, so I think that's mostly it, but oh, I do want to remind you to go ahead and use the chat. I see you're already chatting with each other. Please keep doing that throughout the event. We love seeing you get so excited about what's going on and connect with each other. But I will say, we're gonna have a Q&A at the end of the event. And so if you have a question, go ahead and make sure to pop that in the Q&A box instead of the chat box, just so we make sure we don't miss your questions when we ask those at the end. Okay, so now we're going to introduce our wonderful authors. So first, we are so excited to host the Prince Award winning genius, A.S. King, for her new mind-bending masterpiece, Switch. Um, I have personally been a fan of King since I read Dig back in 2019, and it completely and literally knocked me off my feet. And so obviously, 
she's been at this a lot longer than just Dig. She's been writing incredible young adult novels for years. And the New York Times has called her one of the most important young adult writers writing today. Um, I wholeheartedly agree with this. And I'm definitely fangirling right now, if you can't tell. So moving on from that, um, we also have Martha Brokenborough. And she, oh my gosh, I will miss my page. She is a local author to Seattle and a longtime friend of Third Place Books. She's written a several nonfiction young adult books, wonderful picture books. And this fall, she has a YA fantasy coming out, which you'll definitely want to check out. Um, she is a former editor at MSN.com and has interviewed people from the Jonas Brothers, which I'm very jealous of, all the way to Slash. So she's got quite a range. And um, her work has been published in several places, including the New York Times. So I will now invite our authors to take the stage. I'm so excited to talk about Switch and emotions and tilting houses, and I just cannot wait. Um, so don't forget to keep chatting, put your questions in the Q&A box, and I'm going to disappear now, but I'll still be around to answer any questions that you might have in the chat. So here we go. Thank you, Claire. Thank you, Claire. Thank you, Claire. Hi, Martha. Amy, I've just been fighting back tears. I'm so glad to be here. That's, I don't know what emotion that is. It's complicated, but it's joy and it's sadness that we're not in person, but delight, relief. Oh, um, I miss you so much. I put that picture on Twitter of us embracing in the Burlington airport and I go through it every now and again. my picture- The one where you were standing up. on a box? <laughs> the one where you were standing in the hole? <laughs> that one. <laughs> Yeah. Anyway, because um, we're the same height. And so um, I love Martha. You need to know that I love Martha. And this is the thing. When I decided to, to talk about this book, I was like, what am I going to talk about? I'm like, I'm going to talk about feelings. And um, and who better to talk um, about feelings with than your friends who trust you and whom, whom you trust. And I trust Martha with everything. In fact, Martha is my favorite question of Martha. Actually, we should talk about this later if we remember it, which was, I had a line in a, in a, um, in a lecture. It was my David Gill and me lecture. Um, and I said, I trust in an untrustworthy world. And you came up to me or texted me afterwards and said, how do you do that? How do you trust in an untrustworthy world? And we, maybe we can ask that later, but right now I'm gonna read because I keep forgetting to read. Um, so I'm gonna read a little bit from this book. Those of you who've been here a few other nights, now's the time to go get a drink or whatever. I decided to bring a drink because Nick Stone told me to. No, she didn't, but um, there you go. Um, and it's later in my time, so I figured whatever. I'm gonna read for about five minutes just to give you an idea what the book is about. Um, so I'm gonna read from Switch, which just came out on Tuesday. Um, and um, yeah, I'm just gonna start and go from there. Sounds good? Sounds good, all right. Prologue one, because there's two. Time stopped. The fold. We have arrived at a, at a fold in time and space. Nothing moves forward, a scientific dilemma yet to be solved fully. You are probably confused. We are confused too. Analog, digital, stopwatches, cell phone providers argued over the idea of fake time, decided it would be unethical, left us with our lock screen picture, no clock, no date. It is and has been June 23rd, 2020 for nine months now. It's a fluke, an irregularity in space. We just have to be patient. Our hair grows, babies are born, people die, but time has stopped. We are being held for ransom. No one knows what the ransom is, who to give it to. Solution time. Inside of a month, the Secretary of Education enacted solution time. Curricula cut for every classroom, every school, university, every state to solve the world's time problem. Students would figure it out, be sufficiently distracted. The first outcome of Solution Time was New Clock, invented by three 19-year-olds in a summer session community college in Reading, Pennsylvania. New Clock exists in one place, newclock.com. On the internet, it is now the most visited web page of all time. It tells you what, time, what the time and date would be if Earth hadn't fallen into a fold in time and space. For the record, New Clock says it's presently Monday, March 15th, 2021, 1611. They use military time just in case this really is an alien invasion. You get used to it. That's what they said would happen. 
Sun still rises in the morning, sets in the evening. We still eat dinner around 1800. I refuse to pretend that new clock is the solution to being in a fold in time and space though. Solution time was not invented so we could find new ways to lie to ourselves. I'm looking for the real solution. I think it has something to do with giving a shit about people. Prologue two, the switch. In the center of our house, there is a switch. It's like a light switch on the wall in the hallway outside the kitchen. No one knows what the switch controls and no one wants to know. So no one in my family ever touches it and we don't take any visitors. This one day, daddy built a box around the switch as a safety. When he did that, I wanted to find out everything about that switch. I pried off the box, stared at the workings, chewed them like gum, but was too scared to flip it, blow the bubble. Nailed the box back on, ignored the box, spited the box, until daddy built another box, a bigger one, plywood, to contain both the switch and the first box. This went on for two years, bigger and bigger boxes to keep us safe. I have been nailed into box number seven, my sister in number nine, my brother in number 11. Daddy lives outside the boxes, hammering. Not what you think. Daddy is from somewhere else, a place where things are different and where people are secure. He is a naturalized citizen, but there's nothing natural about being American, he says. All slick talk and bullshit, he says. Daddy comes from a place where every word is honest. Nobody shoots you. This place is war. He is a soldier with six inch steel nails. This is a circus and he is juggling all of us, war juggling, weapons in flight, circuits in circles. Me, Richard, sister. Me, Richard, sister. I am a missile launcher. Richard is a rifle. Sister is an assortment of bombs. So then we walk into part one, which is called Aftermath. The book kind of moves backwards because did you see the cover? I don't know, whatever. The, the book moves backwards. I'm not going to read the beginning of it. I'm just going to explain the solution time because that's where we're heading, right? We're heading to figure out why am I, why do I have this behind me? So um, what you need to know about solution time is it's a class, like I said, um, and the students are given the first half of the year to kind of make their own experiments and act as an instructor in the classroom to do those experiments. And then of course, write a large essay or a large paper at the end, because why not give young people lackluster projects uh, to keep them completely distracted. Um, what you need to know is that there, the five uh, students in Truda's team, Truda Becker is the name of this character, main character, um, they call themselves psych team because they decided that the human mind had something to do with escaping a fold in time and space versus sort of STEM stuff and physics. Um, and that their uh, advisor is Nigel. Um, the other thing you need to know is that Truda is a fantastic javelin thrower, um, somewhat extraordinary. Um, and in fact, she believes that she's part of the javelin or is the javelin when she throws it. Um, so there, you need to know that. So I'm just going to explain her project. She's just explained what her other, her classmates projects are. She's explained that her friend Carrie is getting into Philip Zimbardo and his time uh, perspective um, theories and things like this. Um, and she then explains her, her, the or her project like this. My solution time class project relies on the ideas of two dead white men. If everything when it occupies an equal space is at rest, and if that which is in locomotion is always occupying such a space at any moment, the flying arrow is therefore motionless. Zeno of Elia, Greek philosopher, and most people think of emotions as special kinds of feelings, feelings that we describe by such words as happy or sad, angry or jealous or in love. Everyone also knows that emotions are powerful forces influencing our behavior. People laugh, cry, become depressed, or blow up buildings under the influence of emotions. Robert Plutchik, American psychologist. I believe that when we are stuck in an unmoving arrow, fold in time and space, emotions are the powerful force that will break us out. Giving a shit about people isn't easy until you give a shit about yourself, secure your own oxygen mask before assisting others, or something like that. Plutchik's clock. Zeno of Alia can be frustrating, explains my flight, gave me magic. Robert Plutchik is a lot easier to understand and is probably going to save my life. I found him online the way people find boyfriends. He was a 20th century psychologist, invented the psychoevolutionary theory of basic emotions. He reckoned there were eight basic emotions that could vary in intensity and that all of them were truly primal to humans, meaning they aren't a choice, meaning they're there for a reason just like your uvula is there so you don't spit food out your nose. He invented an emotion wheel, a rainbow flower with eight petals. The petals have emotion names, joy, 
trust, fear, surprise, sadness, disgust, anger, and anticipation. There's more to it than that, life-saving, plutching through me an understanding of everything, myself. I have made a plutchik's clock, my invention. One hand, eight stops around the rainbow flower, invented new time, feeling time. With eight petals, we can go around the clock three times as opposed to the old analog, only two rotations. Every hour, we can focus our feelings on to one color and we can learn about ourselves and how we navigate emotions. This is half the magic. The other half lives inside Zeno's arrow, like me, in flight and motionless. The idea is that if we put ourselves in the arrow, in the here and now, we can feel what we really feel instead of pretending we don't. In my case, I will survive the aftermath by learning more about what 16 years of living with a series of explosions did to my brain, heart, by putting my answers in a javelin and then throwing it as far as I can. So that is the snippet I am reading tonight to you. Um, and so Martha, hi. Hello, Amy. Well now, how are you feeling? I'm feeling so many things. Okay, so here's a thing, everyone, about Amy. She writes a lot of stuff down on post-it notes. Is this right, Amy? They are everywhere, everywhere. Look, look at them, they're everywhere. They're I have everywhere. like many on my walls with you on them, Martha. One here says, I do think you have the legs of a pony. You said that on my birthday this year. She does, yeah. just legs of a pony. You can't see them right now, but there's like clip clop, clip clop underneath her desk. <laughs> it's amazing. Okay, so to prepare for this, I put a bunch of sticky notes behind me. You can't read them, but these are all of the emotions that I recall feeling over the last day. Um, I learned this exercise. Okay, I was at my college roommate's wedding. My college roommate was the executive producer of TED.com. And so her wedding, it was more of a TEDing. And there were all these lectures and other things that surrounded it. And so I went to one that was given by a psychologist and she was talking about how our brains work. And she does an exercise that she calls pain storming. And I have adopted it and I use it in my writing retreats. But anyway, so you write down all the negative emotions that you felt. I wrote wow. negative and positive, but if you write them down, you know, over the last 48 hours, you can see how much you felt and experienced that you've just pushed out of you and not thought about. And so I thought that in honor of you, I would do sticky notes of emotions. And there's anticipation, um, which is the stupid same joke I've been making all week, but it's true. Anyway. Yeah, but it's pandemonium. That's also here. Um, that's you right there. Pandemonium. That was on the 28th of April. I date my post-it notes. It's funny, anticipation. It's actually the, one of the emotions on this clock that I had, I had not an issue with, but I definitely was like, huh, when do I feel that? Like, what is that? Is that excitement? And to me, I guess excitement is the closest thing I got, you know? Um, but like one of the other ones, it's um, interest. Cool. Um, Cause an interest is so like, that's so me, right? Cause I, I use the word interest a lot on the opposite side, which is if I'm not interested, I, I'm not interested. Like, and that was me in school, right? Um, but then vigilance, I don't know. I mean, that can be, that can be complicated, but anyway. So are you going to share any of those emotions or did you just put them on the tentacles of that octopus or is that a squid? I c it's, it's, I'll is show it? you. It? It's, oh, it's, it's, a, an, it's an octopus. I love it. Um, um, I could share some or, you know, you could. Just, I love that they're around your head. They're around my head. Okay. Share one. Um, Give me one. Um, um, oh, I felt guilt today. <gasps> Because, okay, you know how we wash our hands a ton in, in this still lingering pandemic? Mm -hmm. My hands are so dry. And so I am away from home and I bought some expensive moisturizer and I felt guilty because it was really expensive. I felt guilty. Okay. Okay. Well, I'm going to say you don't need to feel guilty. You work really hard and your hands were dry and that's okay. It's true. I know, but it's like, you can't help what you feel because we've been conditioned, right? We <laughs> That's what this is all about, isn't it? Isn't it interesting how <laughs> true your, your, okay, wait, your book was called a surrealist masterpiece. And I think it should have been a mistress piece. <laughs> Made me angry. Um, we've erased well, women from the realm of 
expertise. And it's a joke, but it's also not funny, is it? It's not. And I love that you brought this up. It was funny. Nick and I were talking last night and I was saying to her about how the voice. OK, so we were talking about the wider idea of basically who is constantly telling us to not have emotions. Right. Because honestly, we've been hearing this since we were young. Right. So who but what's the voice like? And I kind of said to Nick, I'm like, you know what kind of the voice that's always telling me it's always a, again, like this is no offense. I'm not trying to freak anyone out, but it's always white dudes that are like, calm down calm down. We can't take it seriously. If you're, if you're angry, you can't, you can't do that. You can't be mad. You're so emotional or stop crying. I don't know what to do with salt water or whatever it is. Their problem is it's so weird, but then they're always thrilled. And then they're telling us to smile all the time. It's sort of like, Oh yeah, let me just smile right here. It'd be great. Let's draw a smile right here on my face. And so like, um, you know, it's, it's interesting, isn't it? How we are removed and, and who really is the expert in this, like the culture, people don't get, I guess, the patriarchy. They don't get the culture. The fact that the culture is, and I mean, I shouldn't say people don't get it. I think plenty of us get it, but it's just like, we're like, why is that? Well, it's because. Why is it? Answer it. Why? Because, because man is a rational animal. I think therefore I am. Yep. All of, there's so <laughs> much philosophy that is about what's happening you know, in our brains mm -hmm. and, and, you know, like the idea that we can somehow be better and perfected if we're only thinking and not feeling. And that's and like not having a uvula. It's, it is like not having a uvula. And it was funny. I just caught a comment in the, in the chat and, and it's funny because people said this last night too. And when Nick and I were talking about it is that a lot of us hear it from our mothers and we do hear it from our mothers. And I know for a fact that I know my, I think at least this is where I think my mom wanted me to be able to survive in a man's world. And, and in so, because that's what this is, let's be fair. Where's this, this is, we know where we live. We're not dumb. Um, so to be able to be at that, that board table, the way she was in the seventies, which she was the only woman there for a decade or more. Had a girl, Lynn. And she had to, put, you know, put on that face. And she, even when she had to like, look at them and go, you're doing something totally illegal. Like, you know, when they were trying to pick an employee who wasn't going to get pregnant, that kind of stuff, <laughs> you know, she had to be like, this is not a cool conversation and not be angry, not be this, not be that, and just be like this. And so I always felt that that was part of the reason. And I'm, I don't even think I thought that. I think she said it. I think she straight up said it. But I also think that, that, you know, sometimes it's just sort of our moms want us to please who they had to please. We all have to learn how to live in this world. And this world is this world. It is. And I also think that emotions make people, the expression of emotions, we've learned to become uncomfortable around them. And we've yeah. become inept. Okay. So you know this story, Amy, but I'm going to tell it. Um, Are you going to tell your third grade spelling bee story? Yes. <laughs> oh, okay. That goes, there goes question number four. We're good. Go ahead. Oh, we'll just, uh, I'm, see, look at that. I'm wrecking Let's it. Go straight in. Okay. You're not wrecking anything. It's good. So, I was a good speller when I was a kid because I read a lot of books and um, I had won the school spelling bee. I went on to the next level and I had a dream that I had won and it was very exciting, you know. Um, and I got up there and got my, they gave me my first word and it was an easy one, length. And I'm like, duh, that's easy. And I spelled it really quickly. And you know how in the alphabet G and H are next to each other? They are not next to each other in lengthen. And so I heard the little ding. And the first emotion I felt was shock. Like what? I didn't spell that wrong. And I did. I just, you know, I got it wrong. And it was stupid. It was an easy word. It was an embarrassing word. It was not even a cool word to get out. Of. I was beside myself. My principal, school principal had come to watch. Were you 10? You were nine? What were you? Nine. And she'd come to watch. And um, I was weeping. And I leaned into her and she told me, you need to get more control over your emotions. Um, it was not, hey, you know, you tried, you still have more chances. I'm proud of you. It was, I had gotten out and then I had failed by showing the absolute sadness. Um, here's another story. When I was really tiny, um, if someone just said my name in a stern way, I would cry. And my parents thought it was hilarious. And they took Super 8 movies of me and it's silent. It's just the tick, 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 tick of the film. And then me going from happy to extremely sad. And anyway, that is how sensitive I am. And to be in this world 
and told that the emotions are the thing that is wrong with me, I mean, ouch, it's really hard. Tell me what your teacher did the next day when you came in from the spelling bee. Okay, so my teacher. Um, the so next that was the principal day, that said that, that to you. That was the principal um, who told me I needed to get a handle on my emotions. My teacher, um, who I actually had two years in elementary school, um, she brought ice cream bars for the whole class and said that she was so proud of me. And it made me feel so good. You know, like here I tried and I, because of my efforts, everybody gets ice cream because that's the world I want to live in. Like if I work hard, everybody gets ice cream, right? Yep. Yep. And I mean, someone has said in the, in, it was Libby of all people, I think it was, yes, shame pisses me off too. And yet shame, this is the thing. This is this, when I go into schools, right. I'm not like, I, I do a pretty wide, um, a pretty wide presentation, but really all I'm like, I'm all I'm doing is kind of hitting from every facet, every angle I can trying to tell everyone in that, in that room, don't let shame trip you up. Don't let your trauma, the shame from your trauma, right? Like, don't let any of this trip you up. In fact, face it, feel it, you know, move through it, understand that we all make mistakes and, and just trying to get people like, like to, to try and talk to people about making mistakes. It blows my mind. I'm like, hold on. Like I always say, like on stage, if I'm not making 10 mistakes a day, I'm not living. Look, I'm not that proud of my mistakes. You know, I made a few today and um, I hope I hope to rectify those in the future. But like there are people who really still get wound up about like simple mistakes. And I always I tell a story about my ex-husband breaking at my favorite glass. And I, I had no idea. I just noticed it wasn't around. And I was like, hey man, where's that? This is years ago now. Where's that glass? And it was, it broke. That was the answer. It broke. I'm like, spontaneously? And I wasn't like trying to blame anyone. I just wanted to know the answer. Like, how did it break? And when did it break? And how, like, why it wasn't, oh man, I, I broke your favorite glass. I was actually nearby apparently when it, when it, when it broke. And it was, it was an easy thing. It was taking, you know, he was taking them out of the dishwasher and it broke. And I'm like, I don't care. I'm not going to judge you or freak out or anything. It's just a glass. But I'm like, where is it now? And he's like, oh, wrapped up in a box in the, in the recycling. I'm like, you hit it? you know, or whatever. It's just sort of like, but that's a 50 year old man at that time. You know, like, I like to, to be that crippled by shame and to be that, that upset by making a mistake or, or by breaking something, which is funny. Cause on the other side, talk about the other side of it, like anger or rage recently. And this, you'll see this in a book I'm writing, you know, recently I was like, Hey, what happened to my favorite mug from that? You know, the only mug I'll ever get from the Los Angeles times festival of books the year I won it. Um, and it was like, oh, I smashed it. And I say, because I'm all innocent and, and normal, I say, oh, was it by accident, like coming out of the dishwasher? He said, no, on purpose. And I was like, okay. And I just let it fly. And, and here I am. Um, but it's funny, isn't it? How we, how, we, how we do things. It's funny how we do things because of shame. It's funny how we hide and run and how we have to know everything. Well, it's, the shame just, I mean, I'm, I'm looking at the comments and, you know, people are responding to this and, and understand because everyone's felt this and, you know, we do something wrong, we're somehow embarrassed or we think there's, you know, something insufficient about us and then we feel shame about it. So it's almost as though the emotional layers we build around things are like plywood boxes of a sort. Perhaps, um, Martha. Perhaps, and perhaps the whole point is to remove the plywood and perhaps the world wouldn't spin as much and you wouldn't find as many tiny erratic bombs. And, but you can only find the tiny erratic bombs if you remove the plywood. Now you're all going, what are they talking about? But there's plywood in this book and there's tiny erratic bombs in this book. And that is true, Martha. I mean, that is true. And when Martha read the book, she wrote, she wrote to me and we were texting and she said something about having a crowbar and I don't have a problem telling you there's no spoiler in the fact that true to our main character at night when everyone's sleeping she goes around the house and removes nails to try and get this plywood down and every day there's more nails than she needs to you know there's more nails than she can ever remove um and in a way sometimes you know especially with this book I think I wrote this book blindly I wrote this book it took a long time I had to write it a few times it's the first book I, I wrote since since I lost my daughter Gracie never thought I'd write again so um in a way, a lot of the metaphor was a obvious, but at the same time, completely lost on me. I have a feeling I'll be, be learning from this book like 10 years from now. Um, okay, that was one of the things though that I wanted to 
talk with you about because I know you've been working on this for a long time and um, experiencing, you know, trauma and little bombs going off. Oh, yeah. um, and yet it felt also so linked to what we are collectively going through mm -hmm. as a society where the pandemic stopped many of the functions of the world. And um, so how did that happen? How did it happen that the two coincided? Yeah, I, how did you I think that? it's, I, I'm magical. Okay, so here's the deal. When something, I mean, I think we've all experienced this in one way or another, like um, for different things. I, I can only connect it to losing a child, which I wouldn't wish on anybody, not even my worst enemy. But when something like that happens, you need the world to stop. And, you know, you just need the world to stop. You need everything. You need time to stop. You really have to uh, stop time. <laughs> and so that, so that nobody expects anything of you because you can't do anything. You're completely, I don't know, suspended in space. And so um, what happened was by complete fluke, I had to release a book four months later and um, which was dig. And I, I did my taxes for 19, you know, and 20 as you do. And I was going through my receipts and I'm like, I was in Austin. I was in Atlanta. I don't remember being in Atlanta. I don't remember being in Washington. I don't remember being in Baltimore. I remember for certain scenes. I remember, you know, I remember going to museums. I remember, you know, I remember, you know, weird little things like that, but I don't remember any of that year. And um, what was interesting was that kind of once that first year went through, the pandemic kind of came and saved me from a bunch of strange things. I hate to say it saved me because of course it damaged and hurt many people. I've, I lost a family member to COVID. So I, I, I understand the loss and I, I don't like that it was, a, I don't consider it a good thing. Um, but for me, I got to kind of be in my house and really look at my life, Martha. I got to really look at my life and go, okay, all right, I got to deal with this for the rest of my life. I got to somehow navigate this. This will never go away. I will never see my daughter again. And every year she'll turn another year and my other daughter will grow and surpass the age that, that, that Gracie lived to and all the just hugely complicated things that go with child loss. And, um, and then I realized that there was a large complication to my grief. And that was that, you know, I was in an incredibly, and I already knew I was in an abusive marriage and you knew that for years and plenty of people have known that for years. And it was time to make sure that stopped happening. And so I tried to do it in the most compassionate way I could and gave as many chances as I could. And then was like, yeah, no. Um, and so for me, I think time stopped so I could take care of my life. That's what happened. I caused the pandemic. That's it. I'm sorry. But that's how it worked for me. Like, that's honestly how it worked. As weird as it sounds, like, for me, it was the oddest timing. Like, I feel so bad for the class of 2020. I, I, feel, I feel pretty bad for the class of 21, to be honest, because they had a very strange senior year and, and it was whatever. But when I think about 2020, that was the class that Gracie was supposed to graduate in and they didn't even get to walk. And I was like, oh man, she would have hated this. So in a way, there was a lot of like weird little, I don't know how to explain it. I think I'm babbling now, I'll shut up. But I, did I answer your question at all? It, it did. And I think, you know, to sum it up, like when you write a book that is deeply and powerfully true to you, um, the corresponding truth of the world will reflect it back. And I think, you know, we're, we've all, the pandemic has been collective grief for all of us. It's been yeah. the trauma um, of the Trump administration, um, which culminated, I mean, hundreds of thousands of people died unnecessarily because- Oh yeah. He didn't give a shit. And um, so I, you know, it's all of these things came together. This brings me to a question that I have for you because I haven't asked you a question on my list yet. All right. So on your website, you have a, you have your bio and at the end of it, it says Martha has opinions too. Now I know you wrote this because you don't want your employers to get blamed for your opinions, which none of us do, do we? Um, but Martha has opinions too, sharp ones, funny ones, ones that matter to her. And I thought, ooh, what does that matter to her? And I thought about you when you were writing an Unprecedented, which of course is the biography of, um, and a very true, a very accurate biography of Donald Trump. And I remember, I remember you during that time. I wanted to hold you like I did in the picture that I posted on Twitter. I wanted to hold you forever. So I wanna ask you, what is your mission on earth? And <laughs> That's the first question, which is pretty wide. What is your mission on earth when it comes to your opinions, your sharp, funny opinions? Um, I know you've always been politically motivated or politically minded. 
Um, and so I wanted to know, um, I wanted to know if, if your anger from that time, and I know that we all, I, I can say we all, but I think that I can pretty much say we're probably all pretty like-minded here tonight, um, that if our anger, from, if that anger turned into anything incredibly useful to you, I will quote um, Nick Stone from last night, the root of your anger um, can lead to compassion. And I wanna know if that happened to you. Um, you know, for me, it's been incredibly clarifying. And so, you know, I do know why I'm here and it is to, um, it is to, to love ferociously. And by that, I, I don't that. mean, um, you know, just there, there bunny, it will be okay and have some cocoa. No, it's to um, see where there is injustice, see where there is um, unnecessary pain and do what I can to alleviate it and um, to tell the truth in the process. I mean, I think about the books that I've written and telling the truth is, I mean, I did it with Santa. <laughs> yes, you um, did, and you saved so, my butt last year. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> um, and with Trump. And so I, you know, th that is my way of loving ferociously. Oh, you know, you made me cry. So this is the first time I actually had some tears on the tour of the emotions because to love ferociously is a big deal to me. And again, like there's one thing I had a lot of, uh, I, I constantly am saying to young people, you know, uh, even more than I ever did before after losing Gracie is you got to live the shit out of your life, live the hell out of your life, live it like it's on fire. And that's what I'm doing. People are like, how are you not on the road face down? I'm like, I'm doing this for Gracie. Every book I, every book I write now. And this is, I mean, Gracie, one of her last things that she, that she really wanted to do in the last week of her life was she was discussing talking about emotions with um, kindergarten to, through second grade, you know, mostly really young kids and trying to invent an initiative. And she left me a little post-it note. And, and, and the funny thing is number one on the post-it note was kill gender roles, which I thought was amazing for a first, you know, that's how you were gonna start by getting pe people to emote was to kill gender roles because she, and it says boys and girls can have feelings, you know, and I think that was number three. But um, for me, I mean, that's not why I wrote this, you know, in a way like this is just, I don't know what happened, but for me living and loving ferociously is absolutely paramount and it's very important to me. Um, let's see. Um, I already asked you what your mission on earth was and you already took the third grade spelling bee questions for me. Oh, let's talk about emotions. That, okay. We've already talked about, okay. I'm going to tell you a story and this is no offense at all. Okay. And, but I wonder how many other people have, I don't listen to as many audiobooks as a lot of other people out there, but, um, since my first audiobook was made, which is Please Ignore Vera Dietz, um, the first time I, I, I'd never, I didn't know what to do. They were just like, we're making an audiobook. And I'm like, that's awesome. And that was about it. Right. And then I got some and some copies and I decided I would listen. I would I'd actually, tomorrow is the Rochester Teen Book Festival. And I, I would drive up every year and I, I would wish I could drive up this year, but it's online this year. Um, so if you're interested, go to my sites and you can find the links. Um, but anyway, I was driving to Rochester, five hours up, five hours back, 10 hours, perfect audiobook time, right? So I decided I would listen to Please Ignore Vera Dietz, which is weird. I don't usually read my books um, after I publish them anyway. The voice that was put on by an adult woman to read Vera's voice was like a teen girl, you know, like she was like a teen girl and she was like this about things. And it was just like, uh, and I was like, wait, what? Cause this is what Vera Dietz sounds like right up in here. This is Vera Dietz. This is the same person that delivered pizza. This is the same person that got, has got this lump from the skinhead. I still have it. All those stories that Vera went through, that's me. And she sounds like this, not like this, like always whining. And like, this is what girls sound like. And I'm like, why do girls sound like that? So what happened was the next time I sold an audiobook, I said, hey, can I talk? the producer and I said hi how you doing do you hear me right here you hear this voice right here this is what my characters sound like and we've we've formed a beautiful relationship and I love my producer and now he lets me read my books which is really cool um but why do we assume emotions why do we assume that girls are always depressed or seeking seeking drama or what like what is it like can you think of any other assumed emotions how does that make you feel how, did, how often does that happen to you? Is it constant? Okay. So my thinking on emotions is this, that the rational has been assigned masculine. The emotional has been assigned feminine. True. And so um, 
we can, because we live in a misogynistic patriarchy, um, and I won't even get into the other problems, but you know, that's what we're talking about here. Um, everything that is emotional is feminine and is therefore subordinate. And so it's all, it's all meant to um, insult and demean. But this connects to teenagers. And this is one of the pieces. Somebody asked me a long time ago, like maybe, I don't know, back of early books. And I said, I connect the teenagers because I'm a woman. And they were like, what? I'm like, none of us are taken seriously because emotions are bad then, right? You know, um, reason is good. So reason is here and emotions are bad. And I can be rational. I'm one of the most rational people I know. I'm also one of the most emotional people I know. So I don't know about most. I mean, I've got the whole Vulcan thing going on. You're a Vulcan um, with the heart of kryptonite or whatever. <laughs> whatever, whatever works. But, um, but that's the thing, you know? So I always say, you know, people are like, why do you write for teens? And now they often ask that in a judgmental tone. And I go, cause they're smarter than you. And then, then they go, what? And then I go, no, I said, I write for teens because are, you know, why are you asking that question? And why do you have that look on your face? And why, why with the tone? Like, why don't you respect teenagers? And they're like, well, you know, ooh. and I'm like, no, I don't understand why you don't understand why, why you don't respect teenagers. And a lot of times it's because they have emotions. And then we also were, I mean, we are collectively asked to bully teenagers in this culture. Um, we're supposed to bully everything they like. So I'm, I'm a little behind right now. So I'll say K-pop instead of Justin Bieber, because that's a little old, but um, you know, we're supposed to look at, um, you know, Billie Eilish, she go, oh, she just looks so blah, blah, blah. And she's so emotional. She's always so depressed or whatever it is we're supposed to say about these people that teenagers like, but especially teenage girls, um, you know, although I'm sure there's plenty to be said about Fortnite, but um, we'll leave that to Leonard. Um, but, um, but like, I don't know. It's, it's interesting because women are the same. Oh, they're emotional. Don't listen to them. Oh, teenagers. Oh, don't listen to them. They know everything. You know, it's so strange. It's like it? a middle school girl is an insult. Oh yeah. Why should that be an insult? You know, it, I, I love middle school girls and I love teenagers and I, it just, um, when I see it on Twitter, I'm like, don't be a misogynist. Um, I, you know, I, I, I get really mad because, um, it is just a throwaway insult and it's totally unacceptable. And it leads to shame wherever it is on the octopus. Well, it also it leads to shame, but it also, and honestly, it leads straight to violence against women. It leads to violence against against teenage girls. It, it leads to like somebody today, and I wrote a poem about it. Somebody today told me, um, and I don't have it in front of me, but they they said something like um, authentic. And what did they say? Hold on. Oh, it's not open anymore. Damn it. Um, they said, "Oh, I never thought you'd end up in that situation." i.e. you know domestic violence um because you're such an authentic and something person and i was like yeah strong authentic women that's a prize that's the candy that's the whipped cream you want whipped cream on that oreo shake oh hell yeah that's me and to get somebody like that controlled that's a buzz for somebody like that and that's just how it goes and it's like what did you did you believe in this woman's like in her 50s did you believe all these years that it was just what airheads or something whatever your other judgments are <laughs> about they, other women they like they deserve it because they're not as smart as the man or they're not as like no i mean yeah. i don't know it's it's so strange but like honest i mean honest emotional women are absolutely like you know we nearly have a target on our head for those guys i know that because he wasn't my first controlling jerk you know what i say it a lot when i'm talking about writing and the whole purpose of novels i think is to make us feel and to practice feeling yes. what it's to be a human and the purpose of emotions in our lives is to get us to think it's it's it fills our bodies with these feelings so that then we think about okay now what i feel this and now what do i do and practicing those feelings in books i mean it's great to experience injustice in a book before you experience it in the world and and you know unfortunately our little children of color are experiencing it yeah you know and then people say things like oh that doesn't belong in a book for little kids don't put sexual abuse in a book oh for no kids. yes oh, save them from racism until they're older well this is i might want my first bit of hate mail was about you put rape in a book for 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 teenage girls they they, they shouldn't be reading about that i'm like what are you high on what 
I want what you're having because most of the girls that I work with, most of the survivors I work with um, have already experienced this um, by that age. So what world do you live in? And then she actually wrote back. That was the only time I ever wrote back because it was my first. Um, and she, I said, I said that and she said, well, yeah, I experienced it younger than that, but I'm like, wait, talk about repressing everything. Talk about that internalized misogyny. Talk about all the things that we've been talking about tonight. It was like, hold on. So that happened to you, but you don't want anybody else to have an easier time. It's like that thing I saw recently where people who still, who, who already paid their school loans, didn't want to school, <laughs> the school loan uh, forgiveness program. It was like, that's mean. You're just mean. That's just me. It's <laughs> that's just me you know, horrible. The thing people are like, well, I suffered and I'm fine. And so my children will suffer and they will be fine. As if fine is the goal. Yeah. Yeah. Right here. It's, it's, yeah, I agree. It's, it's a very strange world we live in when it comes to that. Um, it was funny. You just said something, but I, I didn't write it down. So now I forgot what the heck I was going to say. Um, no sticky notes. Dang it. That's okay. Where are they when I need them? Um, oh yeah. So I would no, you were talking about, uh, yes, you were talking about, I was talking about emotions assumed of women and girls. And we're talking about that. And you were talking about, um, young children of color and watching what's going on around us. And if we don't, if we put that in a book, that's, that's bad. No, I tried to trace it and it didn't work. Do you see how I chased it? I chased it's, it hard. It's an octopus. You did great. Amy. You really, really did. Really <laughs> hey, thanks. Um, I wanted to ask you a question. What does it mean to give a shit about the world? What does that mean to you? To look like? It means, it means to, well, trusting in an untrustworthy world again, Martha, we get back to the question you asked me many years ago. Um, it's, um, it means to be vulnerable enough to put yourself out there, even if you are going to get shit thrown at you. And that's one of the things like people be like, you know, like part of me wants to be able to regret my whole life because of what I threw away since I was 23 years old, you know, with this, with this person who didn't know how to live right or treat me well, but I didn't throw away my whole life. In fact, you know what happened? I got a cast on my arm in 1994. And so I couldn't write my grandfather letters from Ireland anymore. And so my sister-in-law loaned me her typewriter. And so there was a typewriter on my desk and there was some paper. And one day I decided with my broken hand that I was, I couldn't take it anymore. I it only, at that point it was two years and I've been reading the journals from those two years and, and the years, I didn't have a lot of them. I stopped journaling. It got so depressing. My life got so shitty. I stopped journaling for 20 years. That says a lot for a woman who journals as much as I do. But um, I started writing novels. And so, and that's trusting in an untrustworthy world too, right? Cause you throw them out there and you're like here and people can go, uh, this wasn't as good as it could have been. I'm like, nothing's as good as it could have been. <laughs> like, like, that's not a good way to say it. But um, then I stopped looking at reviews and that's cool. But like, um, that's what I did with my emotions. That's what I did with my pain. It's what I did with all the emotions I wasn't allowed to have because those were named. If they were negative, I wasn't allowed to have no crying or that's just you trying to seek attention. And that's like a 40, like this is a person. I'm a, I'm a full grown person. I'm not even 12. Not to say a 12 year old isn't a person. They are. But just sort of, that's what I ended up with. What a cool thing. You can, you know, it's, it's that classic turn lemons into lemonade thing, which is funny because that's the same crap we heard um, from the principal after we spell lengthen incorrectly. But it is what I did. I just, I went in and I, the first manuscript I wrote was frenzied. If you saw it, it, it would, it would drive you crazy. It goes right off the end of the pages. It's single space, right to the edges on this onion skin legal size paper. I was, I was, I was channeling hell onto this page and, um, and then it got better and better and better. And it took me eight novels to get, to get to actually writing a proper novel, but that's, um, I forget what the question was, but that's what I ended up doing. And so what does it mean, right? To give a shit. Um, to me, it means, um, you know, dig is a great example of what giving a shit is. It's looking at something as disgusting, something that makes me so angry and so upset that I could never find words for, which is the white supremacy. Understanding that I'm white and I'm part of it because I'm white. Understanding that I have a job. I have a responsibility to the world while I'm here because of it. And especially where I live, where I've seen people in full clan gear and I've been, you know, I've been beat up by skinhead and, you know, these sorts of things. Um, 
and not being able to put it into words in the right way and then writing something like dig and being able to somehow show every single character, including Marlon with a bit of compassion. Because the fact is, is that if we don't, we're vilifying people and therefore the people who need to learn won't learn. You have to, like, I've never been able to argue a racist out of their, out of their, out of their mindset. Neither have you, I, I'm sure. I'm sure you've never been able to do it. Um, and yet I'd rather just say, here's a pie. You are in it. Is it delicious or not? Taste that and see if it sticks in their, in their, in their teeth just a little bit, you know, so that maybe they can see themselves, I don't know, with a new set of eyes or something. Okay, but I have a hard question for you because this is one that I struggle with, you know, because I try to be compassionate. And yet there are some people for whom I cannot muster compassion. Are there evil, irredeemable people in yes. this world? Yes, there are. There are evil, irredeemable people who are born with bad energy and they're going to die with bad energy and they're going to be reborn yes. with bad energy. That's how I feel. Absolutely. And I think that they are the people we need. And I mean, yes, do they have trauma? Do, do they come from other things perhaps, but they have to be able to um, rectify that. That's their job. Their job is to get better. And if they don't get better, then they're just going to keep causing pain. Um, and that's a shame, but I can't, but yeah, I believe that there are Martha. And a lot of it, it's funny, I, I have, I'm going to use, I can't I'm going to start a sentence with this, but my shaman, there you go. My shaman and I were having a conversation a few months ago and she just threw out, she's like, I can't wait till this, this age of narcissism is gone. And I said, whoa, back up, what? Um, because narcissism, I, you know, it's an interesting, it's an interesting study. Um, and there's a little bit of conversation about, well, at least echoism in this book, which if our narcissism isn't mentioned for good reason, um, because it shouldn't be, <laughs> because it's usually invisible. Um, and we try and pretend that it doesn't, isn't there. But I said, what do you mean? And she's like, oh, no, it's the age of narcissism. And I was like, are you using that like, like the way that people use like selfies on Instagram narcissism. She's like, no, I'm actually talking about like legit narcissism is people who just have no empathy and are just whatever. And I'm like, you know, I, and I haven't, I've yet to look up what she meant. Like I've yet to look up this age of narcissism, but I think she's just, she's so used to being inside this beautiful spiritual realm that she's just sick of coming up against evil energy or, or, or bad energy, I should say, or dark energy. Um, and that is where, that's where she, that's where she stood anyway. So I do think that there are people in the world who are, I don't know about irredeemable, but they're certainly, they're not going to be okay. And they're not going to get better. And they are going to cause other people pain, Martha. And that's just where that, that's just where it's at. And it sucks, but there you go. And the rest of us have to just learn how to boundaries, boundaries. But not plywood balls. Not plywood balls. That's on our hearts. We got to keep our heart open for, so that we can embrace people like you. I can embrace people like you because otherwise I just cut my whole self off. That's no good. And I've been hurt and hurt and hurt and hurt. I mean, I've been hurt and hurt and hurt and hurt some more. And uh, I would, if I, if I closed my heart off, I wouldn't, I wouldn't have you as a, as a beautiful friend. Um, and so many of the people who are here tonight as, as beautiful friends, like, so I plan on staying open and staying bright and staying light. And, you know, for me, I also say, I always say it this way, if people do bad on me, they're the ones who have to live with that. Not me. You want to hurt me of all people? Come on now. You know I'd cut my leg off and give it to you. You know what I'm saying? I would be like, like you need a leg. Pony leg. I, I, yes, I do have legs like a pony. So um, I would give you that leg uh, should you need it. And um, and that's the kind of person I am. So it's just sort of like, oh, you're going to hurt me? That's definitely on you, buddy. You know, that's how it works. So yeah, I don't know. It's the best I got. I don't, I don't, I don't, it's the best it's I got. Wonderful. And I love you. I love you and too. And Claire's here. I know Hi. she's got questions for us. Hi What's everyone. This has been so wonderful. Let me just say, I've already cried like twice. I think a couple oh. people have in the chat too. So I just want to keep this going with like a few more questions. Um, so the first one I want to start with is from Joe. Um, and they want to know how did witnessing and living through the pandemic affect your writing process and themes, if at all? And do you think those changes or themes will stick with you going forward? All right, Martha, you answered that one first because that's open. So I'm just going to, I'm going to ask you what you think. How, how did the pandemic shape your um, writing? You know, I think it kind of capped off a, a unit of study that I began in the Trump administration. Um, there are people who lie and spread lies and don't care enough about others um, to take care of health. And, um, you know, we've gone from medical workers wearing garbage bags and not having 
um, personal protective equipment to you know more than 500,000 people dead um, and so I've had to recalibrate some of my optimism I have not closed off my heart but um, the work that I do because I want to tell the truth to children must include the truth that there are some people um, who refuse to care and, and that is awesome. Yes. And that's kind of, it's funny because there's, there's a bit of that in this, in the switch in this book. And what's interesting is that for the, for me, the pandemic, at least toward the end of it now, right. Because it, it showed me what it showed me and said, Hey, look at the food you're eating. It's rotten. Stop eating the rotten food. Go for the good food. Right. That was a big metaphor. Cause I don't eat rotten food, but you know what I'm saying? And so I've come to this other place where like the idea of love is totally even bigger than it was before. And I was a big love muffin to begin with, right? But now it's like, like I have, this is my next YA book, right? I don't mind showing this to you guys because it means nothing to you, but it means everything to me. And look, Martha has seen it before. It's a hamster tube with a chair in it. And, um, but you see this little thing down the bottom, I added this and it has a little heart in it because I realized there could be a subplot and the subplot could involve love. And I think that what happened was for me until this pandemic, I had my heart all closed. My heart was enclosed in plywood because it had to be because I lived with a dangerous person. And now I, um, I don't. And so now I took the crowbar to it. So that's, that's what the pandemic did for me. And I don't remember the rest of the extra questions there, but that's, I think that's a good answer. <laughs> what else do you have, Claire? <laughs> um, the next one is, I think, just in tone with how like, personal and like deep this conversation has been and Olivia would like to know if either of you have any tips for outreach and advocacy in fairly like rural areas well I'm fairly fairly rural um outreach or advocacy well I mean you gotta you gotta find it where you find it right I mean I I was I, my local city when I was living up in in well Reading Pennsylvania where they invented new clock um but when I was living out there um my best friend since I was very young started uh, the local v-day chapter right so Evan so there's v-day um so we did the vagina monologues and and do that you know I was able to find I worked with a lot of survivors um, I know and I have a group of group of we call them the vaginas we're all vaginas <laughs> when you're on the show it's all the vaginas are coming or they're not um, but uh, it's a strange verb to choose for that sentence but we're both leaving it go Martha which is fantastic anyway I so <laughs> I guess I didn't leave it alone but that's okay um, never do I, <laughs> stop. I should never pun with you you're so punny okay Anyway, advocacy, there's that. Um, there's also, um, you know, there's things that we can do from, from anywhere that help um, kind of all different things. So, I mean, you know, I'm a big believer in the Trevor Project. I have a, a, a former student who is, a, is a, someone who works in the Trevor Project. So I feel like once I start to volunteer again, it's something I can do from wherever I am, but in the actual rural community, I don't know, you have to look in your community, what's there um, and, and, and outreach. Um, from there, um, that was a very roundabout, vague answer. That was a shitty answer. I'm sorry. I don't know what the answer is. I suppose I you got to look for it. There's just a, there. The world is an ocean of need, and there's a lot of ways that we can give. Um, and you know, rural area like people don't have clean water in lots of. I mean, there's so find something that you're really interested in. And the important thing, having done a fair amount of work with a water charity, for example, is just consistency. You know, if you do $5 a month forever, it ends out, you know, up being a, a big deal or, you know, just whatever you do. I mean, in my neighborhood in Seattle, there is a man who lives in a bus shelter. And so the neighbors, we just use next door and we gather up money and we ask him what he needs and we give it to him. And so there's, you know, they're just, just look yeah. and yeah. you will see. Yeah, I'll, I'll say one thing for the pandemic, the, um, when it came to the food, the, the free and reduced lunch, but free lunch through our school, that was, that was the one thing I found was unbelievable. When I looked at, at what our, our superintendent was there and she was giving out food every day. She was the one handing out like all those, those admins where they're doing that. So, I mean, there's definitely um, things that, we, that can be done through school districts and things like that as well, so. 
Great question. What else you got, Claire? Okay, I think this might be our final one. Okay. It's a bit of a more fun one. Um, Olivia would also like to know, but how does one keep post-it notes organized and not falling down? <laughs> Go. <laughs> um, well, here, I'll show you this, not falling down. There's, there's a bunch, they've been up there for like three months. Those are super organized. That's a book, but it's not really because I don't follow my own directions. But um, I don't know how we do it. I use the super sticky ones and organized. No, I don't. There's just piles of them everywhere. Like I said, I don't even know what's in here, but look, there's like 20 in there. I have no idea what they say. Um, go. Okay. So you can get um, little sheets. Um, they're the clear plastic that is used to hold baseball cards or whatever. Oh, and instead of post-it notes, you can put index cards in those and then you can put it in a binder. So you can tape that biz to the wall or then you can put it in a binder and you are laughing at me, Amy. But it's, it is, if you want to keep that organized. Um, and did you know that the man who invented the stickiness on the 3M sticky notes, he just passed away. I did not know that. Just like this week anyway oh, well they so. changed my life sticky notes and and yeah um and but they yeah. came because people were trying to hold their place in the hymnal at church with paper and he wanted you know the, anyway they they became useful that way so, so it all notes. comes down to hymnals um so martha before we go yep your next book uh technically okay your next ya book is into the into the blood red woods correct that is in september uh, November, November. into the blood red woods. Everything you knew about fairy tales is a lie there. And, but you also have a picture book coming out, this old dog. Um, oh, that that's out? out. That's out from that last year, isn't it? That one's out, but the picture book that comes out on the same day, because what? the world's weird that way, is called I Am an American, the Wong Kim Ark Story. And that's the one. This is why um, people born in America have birthright citizenship because of um, the guts and fortitude of a, an American born Chinese man named Wong Kim Ark. There you go. All right. Excellent. And you can get those um, at third place books, probably signed copies. Am I correct, signed Martha? Copies. Oh, so yeah. is this a place to go for signed copies of anything? Um, I can, yes, I will happily sign anything um, for places easy to get to. And I go to all of their locations and the burgers at the Seward Park what place one, because they have burgers. So they're really good. Okay, good to know. Martha, I cannot thank you enough for joining me tonight. I could have done this for another hour and gone into deeper things. And if there wasn't, I don't know if there's deeper things, but that was wonderful. And thank you for the questions and thank you for coming tonight, you guys. This was a great crowd and you guys were all chatting. And now it's, this is the thing we talked about this before. We're all gonna disappear and I'm not gonna get to catch up on the chat. It's gonna drive me crazy. Um, but um, thank you for all the things you said. Even if I didn't get to see them, you're wonderful. Um, and thank you for supporting me, Third Place Books. And thank you for supporting me, Martha Brokenbro. It means the world. It means the world, like the whole freaking world. You know, I'm your friend for always. Same, same forever and ever. And you just need to get out of that hole and I'll get off the box and one day we'll be the same height. <laughs> just have to learn to fly. Oh. All right, friends. Thanks everyone for coming. And thank, thank you, you very Claire. much, guys. Thanks, Allie, behind the sign. <laughs> bye, Allie, and bye, Allie, and thank you, Claire, for everything. This is really great. This is awesome. Well, I can't wait to come out and see you in person. I know. I can't wait to meet you either. Um, thank you both so much for this. This was a fantastic conversation, and I the chat was off the wall the whole hour, so I think everyone was super excited to be here, and this was just a really special event, so thank you both so much. Again, if you want to get as king's new book you can order that on our website or you can sign up for the subscription box and get two of as king's books and again any of martha's books you can also get on our website and get them signed but thank you all so much for coming and have a wonderful rest of your night thank, thank you. you bye, bye it's really great to see yeah. you bye <laughs>